I felt like the Lord wanted me to minister this to kind of give an explanation of why some of you may be facing what you're facing. You ever just uh, kind of started out sometimes, and, hey Lord, why me? I'm sorry, let me try this in another language. Okay, yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, see how senor. All right. Doris <laughs> Madonna. Amen. If you're a title taker, the title to this message is called the stress test. The stress test. If you prefer a religious title, the title to this message is called the spiritual stress test. <laughs> Amen. In Psalms, <coughs> I really felt impressed of the Lord to, to minister this, to give explanation, or to some of you, it may be a forewarning. To some of you, it may be, uh, oh wow, I could have had a V8, now I get it. But, uh, I just really believe the Holy Spirit just wants to bring some answers to you. Everybody say the stress test. What is the stress test? The stress test is when something, or even us, when we are put under extreme pressure or intense pressure to see how much we can handle. How many of you know what I'm talking about? See, it's kind of like joining the military boot camp. When they first give you your equipment, your boots are way too big. And you're thinking, why are my boots so big? I'm not going to, because you're going to fill those shoes. Because you're going to do something that you haven't done in a long time, and that's called marching. And you're going to march, and march, and run, and then you're going to run some, and then you're going to march. You'll probably march and run, and then run and march. And eventually, your feet will fill those boots. And we will have a tendency when we're going through a stress test. We want to whine. We want to cry. We want to have an attitude. Dun, dun. Dun. How many of you are good tutors? I don't mean the, the royal kind. I'm talking about. <laughs> All right. Psalms 55 verse 19. God shall hear and afflict them. Everybody say afflict. God shall hear and afflict them. Even he that abideth of old. Say law. Think about it. Everybody say say law. Say law means think about it. Because they have no changes. So that means God is wanting change. Are you still with me? Because they have no changes, so what's the penalty? Because we're not changing. Therefore, they fear not God. So I want you to see something here. Let's look at this word afflict, because that's not a fun way to start out a message. The word afflict is the Hebrew word, ana, and it means to lower to distress with mental or bodily pain or to overthrow, to afflict, to bring us a notch lower, whether it's through mental pain or through a, a bodily pain and so forth. Now notice this, God shall hear and afflict them. So sometimes the things that we go through doesn't necessarily come from the enemy. Sometimes God is trying to bring us down a notch not because we're full of arrogance or pride, but because we're fixing to be lined up for a promotion. Are you with me? Look at somebody and tell them I'm, I'm up for promotion. Tell three people around you I'm up for promotion because this is talking about me. Okay? So when you, when you are up for a promotion, in some areas of life, you will be tested to see if you know what you know. Not only to see if you know what you know, but to see that what you have learned, do you know how to apply that? If you do it for a company, an organization, whatever, you're going to have to take a test. If you are in the Marines, or, or uh, you know, the Marines have a crucible. You have to go through this test, a series of tests, in order to see that everything you learned. The military has tests. Let's see if you've learned what you've learned. Do you know your chain of command? Do you know how to put your weapon together? Do you know how to do this? Do you know that? Okay, you know how to do that in the classroom. Let's take you out in the field. And let's go ahead and add some stress to you. And let's see if you qualify going through a promotion. Everybody say promotion. Now, now notice this. God said, it says here that there'll be affliction because they have no changes. 
So I want you to notice God is expecting change to take place. Place. <laughs> I don't know what language that is. So God is wanting change to take place. Okay? So to you and I, when change does not take place, our relationship turns to religion and tradition. Because God is trying to speak to us. He's giving us a word that uh, in order for your family situation to change, I don't need to change you and everybody around you. I, I, I don't need to change everybody around you and your spouse. I need to change you. You know I'm not a politician trying to be popular, right? Okay. <laughs> So God will give us a word. And what we have a tendency to do sometimes is because of past treatment or what we've gone through or what we've endured or suffered and so forth, we don't want to change because we feel it's not fair or it's not just. And so God is saying, well, at times what I need to do is I'm trying to promote you, but I need to put you to a stress test so that when you get to this next level of abundance or prosperity or favor or grace, whatever it is, when you get to this next level, when the enemy opposes you at this level, it's going to be a totally different thing. And I need to know that you're not going to bail, you're not going to run, you're not going to quit, you're not going to give up. So there has to be a stress test. We, do, we, we have stress tests on products before we buy them. If I say products. <laughs> now, what it's referring to here, though, in this in Psalms, contextually, it's referring to the enemies refusing to change because they have no fear of God. That's the subject matter of this. But what I want, what I'm pulling out of this is that sometimes when there's no change, it's not that God, you know, begins to thumb us upside the head. It opens the door for the enemy. Because refusing to do what God has requested, there's a word for that. Mm, let's see, it's called, oh, rebellion. Well, there's another word for it too, it's called disobedience. Now, that's not a very popular thing in the Word of Faith, charismatic churches and so forth. But God's word is still conditional. And if we would be honest with ourselves, it's not always a bed of roses. If it is a bed of roses, you'll soon find a thorn or two. Amen? So let's take a look at, at uh, King David here in Psalm 55 because he, he's asking God to punish his enemies. And this is how it's starting out here. God, they're not doing anything. Why don't you punish them? Okay? The message translation says, verse 19, like this. <laughs> God hears it all. And from his judge's bench, okay, puts them in their place. But set in their ways, they won't change. They pay him no mind. Now, that's a pretty strong indictment about the enemy. But how many times have we heard that still small voice within the side of us that God is saying, if you want this situation a little bit better, you've got to get rid of this. You need to adjust this. This attitude, this mentality, the way that you react, the way that you respond. And I'm sorry, I know I'm talking to the wrong crowd because it could never be any of us, but let's pretend like you know someone. <laughs> Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Because sometimes we don't want to change. Sometimes, because what you said to me, I don't want to change. I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to give up. I'm not apologizing, Lord. I'm not going to ask for forgiveness. I didn't do nothing. Does anybody know? Has anybody been to my ballpark? Amen. Okay. I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. Well, then that opens the door for the enemy. Because it says there's no change. Now, now, we can also say that our refusal to comply with God's directives for our, our lives opens the door for the enemy to come in to bring affliction, mental or physical pains and distress. Because we know that stuff doesn't come from God. Amen? Amen? God's not going to, you know, save us just to, just to break us and bruise us. That doesn't make any sense. But we do know that refusing to comply is rebellion or making excuses is still rebellion. Amen? Amen? Now, well, I just don't seem to have enough time. Well, if you did what he told you to do, that extra time would be there. But because you're not... Never mind. <laughs> All right. 
So that means that some of the problems that we may be facing, okay, right now, and, and, and need not be if we would just become compliant with what God has for our life. Psalms 105, verse 16. Let's look at the message translation. Then he called down a famine on the country, okay? He broke every last blade of wheat. Now, this is, this is during the time of Joseph. And I want to use his example here in order to show you a stress test. All of a sudden, Joseph is finding himself in a famine. The whole country, the whole nation basically is in a famine. There's no grain of wheat whatsoever. Nothing. There's nothing but dust to feed everybody. Okay? Now let me ask you this. Have you ever been through a time when you feel like God's on the other side of the universe and no matter how much you cry out, He's not there? And we've done it many times here. Hello, hello, God, God, where, where are, are, are you, 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 you? Remember, remember, me, me, me. Am I talking to anybody? Okay. And, and sometimes it, do, it doesn't look like that uh, God's going to come through at all. As a matter of fact, the more time goes by, the worse it tends to get. Lord, I don't understand what's going on. And, you know, now the reports are getting worse. Well, I started with this. Now they're saying that. Am I talking to anybody? Psalms 105 verse 17 has a translation. But he sent a man on ahead, Joseph, sold as a slave. I want you to see two things here between this verse. He sent a man ahead. The first thing I want you to see out of this is that God makes provision before you get to your affliction. God sent Joseph ahead to prepare for the famine. Now let's look at Joseph then. Joseph didn't think God was doing anything for him because God had told Joseph, you will rule over your family, you will rule over this nation, people will come down and bow to you, and he's wearing an iron collar and chains and fetters, chains on his feet. Now God is preparing Provision and salvation for seven years through a man who was promised that he would be the head of nations, but according to Joseph right now, it doesn't look like we're going to be head of anything. The only thing I might be the head of is the head cleaner of the cesspool, but that's about it. Does everybody see the situation? So that means that sometimes when we go through some of the difficult times, that we think that God is not there, or God is forgotten, or why is this taking so long? It is, going, it is because we are going through a character test. And we pray and ask God what's going on, and all we get is silence. The crickets are chirping. <laughs> Lord, hello? You can ask any teacher that when students are required to take a major test, they have questions the teacher can't answer. And so sometimes when we're going through a major test, the Holy Ghost, our teacher, is not going to answer. Now you can ask them, I need some Holy Ghost recall. What scripture do I need to stand on? What am I supposed to speak over my household? What do I need to say over my finances? What should I be saying over my body on a daily basis? That I am, I am strong and not weak. Huh? Yes. That all things are working out for my good. That all of my needs have been supplied by God because He cares for me. Huh? That all of my relations are blessed, peaceful, and prosperous because that's the kind of God that, that I have. Are you getting this? Now, so we see two things going on. We see what... Good, because God is preparing a man who's going to be the salvation of millions of people in Egypt. But the man that God is going to use is going through torment and torture. He suffered betrayal. His brothers betrayed him. He suffered beatings and bruises. They threw him in a pit. He was sold into slavery. They put a collar on him. They, he had to walk through the hot desert. Treated like a nothing. Oh yeah, this is God's best. 
Mm -hmm. Are you getting this? But he's going through a test. His brothers were, were envious. His parents were jealous. His dad told him, do you think we're going to bat out to you? Are you getting any of this? And so we see both a good and a bad. And if they knew, if Joseph knew that God was preparing him to be the savior over Egypt and God's people, I wonder if he would have had a different attitude. Now, nowhere does it say he complained or anything. He kept his focus on God. And that's one of the things we need to learn how to do is when we're going through something, the Bible says that if we keep our mind on Christ, we will have peace. Now, how do you lose your peace? You start thinking the problem. We forget the promise. Not only do we forget the, not only do we think of the problem, but we add to the negativity of that problem because we express how we feel. Are you getting this? And that's just an open door for the enemy. So Joseph here is going to be an example to us. And I want you to notice that, uh, again, that God is doing two things at one time. But the central theme in verse 17 is that, but he sent a man on ahead, Joseph, sold as a slave. The central theme is God is preparing for what? Salvation of the people and the character test of a man. Are you getting this? All right. Now, through Joseph's eyes, though, okay, it doesn't. It, it doesn't. He doesn't see himself as being used by God, does he? He's being dragged through the desert by slave traders. Who knows how many miles he had to walk? Who knows if he got to use the bathroom if he needed to? Who knows if he was given any water? Who knows if he fell down and they just kind of dragged him and laughed and mocked? Who knows if there was a taskmaster riding beside him and cracking him upside the head with a whip every now and then? We don't know. Because it's going to get even worse for him. Are y'all still with me? So, you know, <laughs> it seems to him that, you know, this ruling over people was just going to be a fantasy or something. Because he's in the exact opposite place. And how many times has the enemy tried to take you to the exact opposite place of where the prophet or the God's word or the promise that you found showed you you're going to be? God's going to use you mightily. Nothing. God's going to heal your relationships. Well, that's not going well. God's going to move on your body. Well, I've got a schedule for surgery. Am I talking to anybody? All right, so, so we see Joseph here is just a, a, a great example. His dreams are not coming to pass like he thought. I had a vision. I was given a prophecy. God was going to use me mightily. Woohoo! It doesn't look like it. I'm, <laughs> I'm chained up a slave. What am I going to do? Rule the nation in my mind? Am I talking to anybody? So it's going completely opposite of what he thought. Okay, now let's go to Psalms 105, 18. It's going to get worse. They bruised his feet with fetters. What does that mean? That means the ankle chains were so tight on his legs that as he was walking, he became Brother Jerry. The skin was just removed, was just removed from his ankles. They bruised his ankles, his feet with fetters. That, those chains, while he, now think about this. You're wearing these ankle chains, and it's dragging through the desert sand. And you've got to keep up with these guys on horses. If not, you're going out for a drag. And so his legs are becoming bruised, and the skin is being peeled off, and the blood is flowing and it's becoming painful. And, and then with the granules of sand mixing in with the skin and so forth. Then he's trying to just, even if he gets to sit down and rest, the pain just keeps, it, not only is it to scrape the skin off, but now it's burning on the inside. And you know it's shooting up every fiber of his being. And so that's what it says. They bruised his feet with fetters. 
and placed his neck in an iron collar. You're going through the hot desert sun. You've got an iron collar on. You're sweating. You're thirsty. You're tired. And you know if there's an iron collar on you, there's a chain. If there's a chain on you, there's that chain leads to a hand or to a saddle. And if you've got a donkey of a slave trader, what he's going to do, he's going to pull on that chain. He's going to mock and ridicule and make sure that he's going to break your spirit. Is anybody getting this? Now, but remember, God said he's going to be used mightily. Others will bow before him. Now, I don't know about you. If I had to go through this kind of test, I wouldn't volunteer. What am I talking about? I've been going through this kind of test. <laughs> His brother sold him out. He sold as a slave. He can't rule a nation with you know chains of iron. Now, how does how does apply, how does this apply to you and I? I'm so glad you asked. Thank you for asking that. I keep reaching out. God has something for all of us to do for His kingdom. God has something for all of us to do for His kingdom. No one is called to be part of a church. To be so anointed that all they have to do is sit. Because sitters become criticizers. Criticizers become problem people. They can see what's wrong with everything else, but they won't get up volunteer to be a solution to the problem. And they're going to see it every time, and it's going to annoy them. And when you see something every time, and it annoys only you, and it doesn't seem to bug anybody else, Guess who's calling you to take care of that annoyance? That's right, citizen, I said it. <laughs> I just can't stand when then and then here's one that I really enjoy because some of you get really rowdy. I can't stand it when people call you John and Karen. <sighs> you know who I'm talking about. Some of you go. Oh. It's like, put on the boxing glove. Forget that, man. Give me the Wolverine claws. <laughs> Are you getting this? And so sometimes the things that just bugs us the most is our assignment. We start there. And once we're faithful there, God will promote us. Now, let's, let's look at something else. When God puts something in your heart to, be, to do something for Him, and it doesn't have to be extraordinary or being a preacher or anything, but... It may have freaked you out because you didn't either see yourself qualified or worthy. Or better yet, you did like Moses. You got out the list of excuses. Well, I've got kids now. Um, I've got ball practice. Uh, well, my husband doesn't want me in here all the time. Well, my wife said, because there's always something. And, and see what most people never get about God. And this is so funny because I see it every day. People will say that they don't have the time. And the reason is, if you do what God's telling you to do or laid on your heart to do, then the enemy is no longer allowed to fill in those time slots. Because if you're not doing His will, the enemy's going to make sure you don't have time to do God's will. And so once you put God's will first, guess what? God clears the schedule, so not only do you have time to do His will, but now you get to do what you want. But as long as you're in rebellion to that, yeah, go ahead. Keep being in rebellion. I'll give you something else. Oh, look what's happening now. There's a fight. Oh, there's a financial crisis. Oh, that's not working. Oh, what are people going to say about you? Are you getting this? But when you when you tithe your time, Amen. two hours and forty minutes, okay, a day belongs to God. Well, I don't have time for that. No, you don't. But can we check how long you've been on the internet that night? Well, come on, come on. Collins is teaching me how I don't have to do the internet. <laughs> Are you getting this? See, we always got something. Well, I don't see how you do it. Because God's first. Amen. And when you put God first in your relationship, you'll watch how you respond to your, to, to your spouse. You'll watch how you interact with your kids. If you put God first at your work, 
uh, workplace, you'll, you'll watch that attitude concerning your boss. You'll be surprised. See, we always want God to change them, not us. Are you with me? So we're seeing how God is dealing with this people. Joseph got into pride. Uh -huh, I'm going to be ruler over you. One day you're going to bow over me. Hello? All right, let's go a little further. Thank you for your enthusiasm on my life-changing message. <laughs> what happens is when God calls us, we immediately take a self-inventory and come up with a list of uh, fears, which are demonic spirits having access to our lives. Or we come up with reasons and excuses on why we cannot possibly fulfill, much less do or even start what God has put into our heart. Are you getting in? I just don't have the time. I don't see how I'm going to squeeze it in. When you make time for God, God makes your time. He takes all those little, uh, uh, little bitty fires that the enemy starts and puts them out. Because now you're in alignment with his will for your life. Are you getting any of this? All right. <laughs> now let's go, to, let's go to Psalms 105 verse 18. Is anybody learning anything? Now, I do want to say this. I, I really want to reiterate this. I'm not preaching anything to you that I haven't learned or gone through myself. This, this stuff is tried and proven. You don't know how many times. Yeah, do you ever hear the scripture where it says, don't despise prophecies? Let me tell you how you can despise prophecies. Those of you who have been with us for years, God's going to use this church in a mighty way. God's going to, he's just got you tucked aside. He's going to use this church in a mighty way. Oh, there's going to be a mighty work. Oh, there's going to be a multitude. Oh, and one prophet after another after another. And I thought to myself, I hear one more prophet. <laughs> Telling me that God's going to use me in a mighty way. And at the multitude, I'm going to jack them up. I'm going to wait till all the members clear out so I can remain holy. <laughs> then I'm going to repent. Then I'm going to jack them up. Then I'm going to knock them out. Then I'm going to the Catholic Church to go to the confessional, confess my sins, come back and tell you I've done no wrong. <laughs> I got it figured out. <laughs> I made it home. That's how we need to despise the cross. And how many times have we heard or, or you know, people have spoken to our life, oh, God's going to do something with you and your family. Oh, God's going to do something with your husband. God's going to do something with your wife. God's going to do something with your kids. God's going to do something with your finances. God's going to do something with your body. God's got a better plan for you. He's got something else. He's got something bigger. He's got something better. You just hold on. You just hold on. You just hold on. <laughs> Shut up. That's how we can despise prophecy. What does that do? Well, the Bible tells us that when we get something from God, we're to write it down so that when we start running, we can read it and keep running. And those that are running with us can read it and keep running with us. Write the vision that those that see it may run, run with it. What we have a tendency to do, though, is we, we rip that vision off the wall. Because we've run so much, we've run out of time in our estimation. And God does not promote us beyond our last act of disobedience. The Bible says if you're, if you're willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. Doesn't that sound like a condition? If you're willing, not with an attitude, but if you're willing, glad to do it, and obedient, okay, you'll eat the good of the land. What does that mean? Well, that's prosperity. That's abundance. That's having a good life. Okay? So it's an option. Giving in is not being willing. Okay, you say so. Why well, you say so? You're the pastor. Well, go home. Are, are you with me? All right. So Psalms 105a. New Living. There in prison, they bruised his feet with fetters and placed his neck in an iron collar. Now, what happened here? Bondage came. He's going through a character test. God is setting up 
for his promotion. He's being set up. Jesus learned obedience by the things he suffered in the wilderness. He learned obedience. Now, if Jesus, <laughs> let me mess with your doctrine, had to learn obedience. Now, how did he learn it? Well, his statement, his confession, not my will be done, but yours. Not my will be done, but yours. I like to go and knock that person out. Not my will be done, Lord, but yours. What do you want me to do? Can I knock them out? No. You want me to do exceedingly abundantly and above and run them over then? No. Are you getting it? He learned obedience not through the things that were told him or the revelations. He learned obedience through the things he suffered. Is that what the word says? And I told you many preachers won't preach that. And so sometimes, some people, now I'm not saying the person next to you or you, but some people are real donkeys. You can't hit them with the two by four. You have to literally take a skill saw to their head and make some kind of incision through that skull before they realize that some of them go wrong. Are you getting that? And so it says right here that he's in prison. What happens? Well, disobedience will put you in bondage. It could be mental bondage. It could be physical bondage. It could be financial bondage. It could be relationship bondage. Wherever bondage can be, bondage will come. And in this case, he was put in a literal prison. How many of us still are living in some of the prisons of our mind because what some bozo did years past or what some clown said years ago? And we can't get through that open prison door because as soon as we step across that boundary, we hear those words and we believe that that prison door is shut again. Bondage. Now what happens if we say yes to the plan of God? What will happen? Well, in some prison escapes in the Bible, an angel showed up and escorted them out. There's going to be times when God will send people into your life to help you overcome what needs to be overcome. Now, this will be what I would call a friend. A friend is not someone who tells you what you want to hear. A friend is not someone who will help you keep your secret sins or your sins a secret. As iron sharpens iron, so does the countenance of a friend. A friend will tell you the truth. Why? There's a scripture that says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. You have no idea over the past 30 something years in ministry I've heard you. Oh, if you ever see anything in us, please let us know. And we thought it was genuine, so in the beginning we did. Wrong thing to do. Oh, you can't do that. So when people say it now, just smile. Really? In my mind, no way, Jose. No speak English. Mm -hmm. See how I go. Not going to do it. I don't know why Spanish is coming in tonight, but it did. Maybe we're supposed to go to Jalisco down to this. I don't know. See? <laughs> oh, yes. Her birthday, good. All right. Um, now, let's, again, let's, let's look and see what's going on. They put his feet in feathers. So the first thing he did, he's in prison, so that's bondage, okay? So what happens when we're in bondage, we're tormented in our mind over the thought of, of not doing or doing God's will. Now, we won't, we won't think about it when we're out there, but when we come into the house of the Lord, oh yeah, I should be doing that. Oh, God's let me do that. Or maybe he's called you to do something at the house. Maybe you're supposed to be the best husband, the best wife, the best child, the best, I don't know, Yard cut, I don't know. The best employee. Maybe he's laid that upon your heart and you're just having a hard time with it because we feel like we're being treated unfairly. 
Now, I don't know about you, but most people in this position, they would sit in the corner, not even go up to go potty, and, and, and just complain to God. You said I was going to be a mighty man. <laughs> you said I was going to rule a nation, and I was going to help people and live free, and I'm going to be a judgment. And here I am in this dark prison. It's cold, and I, don't, I had to use the potty, and there was no potty, so I just, and I can't have nothing to eat, and I don't like rats. I don't know why these rats are here, but there's rats in prison with me. And so-and-so snores all like long. I can't get no sleep. I'm exhausted. Oh, my God. The water that they give us, there's floaties in the couch. <laughs> Huh? <laughs> but he's going through a test. He's going through a test. Everybody say he's going through a test. Now when it says that his feet were in fetters, okay, that means this this chain or shackle, okay, kind of kept them in place. And what that symbolizes is now that his life is not going nowhere. He's confined. He's restrained. Well, I thought by now, I would have more. I thought by now it would be better. I thought by now it would be the dream. I thought by now, but nothing's happening. Why? Well, symbolically, sometimes we have uh, chains and fetters on our feet and we're not going anywhere. We like to think about it, dream about it, we'll put a picture on our refrigerator or something, but nothing's happening. Hello? So what that means sometimes, we come to a place where we feel like we're stuck. Well, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. You know, I'm, I'm tired of this. What's the use? What's the big deal? Huh? God said he was going to do it. And, you know, and, and we received utterances and, and, and prophecies and yada, yada, yada. And, 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 and that it's the same old, same old, same old, same old. If I hear one more person prophesying, I'm going to knock them out. Huh? I don't, I don't get it. Are you getting this? Now, it also says that he was laid in iron. A, a, an iron collar was placed around his neck. Now, this is where you and I would feel that our movement is restricted, okay? Uh, that we're trapped or choking. Man, I can't seem to get ahead. I can't get nowhere. No matter what I try. I'm just in this situation. Nothing's changing. I'm in this prison cell. I'm not happy. There's torment. Things aren't going the way I want. I, I, I never thought at this age I would be in this position. I never thought I'd be going through what I'm going through right now. Are you seeing this? Sure. And so what Joseph went through in the physical, if we translate it into to, to symbolic language of today, we see how the enemy would love nothing better than when God is setting up for a promotion for us to think the exact opposite. Are you getting this? Because what does he want to do? Well, he wants to separate us from the love of God. The Bible says that neither height nor depth nor power nor principality, neither height, neither neither distance or a spiritual being or a situation or a more powerful spiritual being can separate us from the love of God. Satan couldn't do it because he lost on the cross. Amen. That'd make a good t-shirt lost on the cross. Are you getting this? And so now we, we, we become like Joseph. We feel like we're stuck. There's greatness in every one of us. Why? Because we have a great God and we are his children. So we are patterned after our heavenly father. It's within us to be a people of increase. Because God has increased. It's within us to be a people of prosperity, not barely making it. Because God is the one who prospers. It's within us, not only for us to be blessed, but to be a blessing to others. It's within us to have favor because God is favor. It's within us to have grace and mercy because God is grace and mercy. And as he is, so are we through Jesus Christ. Amen. But we're not living a victorious lifestyle. 
child. And maybe, just maybe, maybe we're going through a process where God is trying to set us up for promotion. And the reason some of us, we go through the same thing over and over and over is because we try coming up with the solution in the same way. Every time. Some of us, we do it by freaking out. Some of us, we do it by taking, taking it out on our loved ones. Some of us do it, we, 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 we do it through chemicals. Blue Bell ice cream. I don't want a slice of uh, a cheesecake, I want the whole pie. <laughs> Sometimes it's through other chemicals, legal or, or, or illegal. Sometimes we do it because, for, we, we do it, our chemical is people pleasing. Sometimes it's rescuing people. Well, if I can fix them, I'll be able to fix my whole past. Codependency. Sometimes we do it by keeping others away. Sarcasm, sharp tongue, smart mouth. Are you getting any of this? Sometimes drug of choice is self-pity. <coughs> Nobody knows. Are you getting it? Yes, Pastor John. Yes, Amen. <laughs> it, it's because these are truths, guys. And see, we should have those blessing blockers. Those are blessing blockers. If you really believe the scripture where it says God wants to load you daily with benefits, every day you would be looking forward to give, getting a blessing instead of holding your breath, hoping that nothing else goes wrong or breaks down. And that's how most people live. <gasps> The fridge goes out, TV goes out, car goes out. Hello. Am I talking to anybody? Let, 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 me, let me bring this life changing message to a close and we'll pick up next time. Psalms 105 19, New Living Translation. Now notice this. Until the time came to fulfill Joseph's word, the Lord tested Joseph's character. The Lord tested Joseph's character. What was part of that test? Being put in honor. What was part of that test? Cruel mistreatment. What was part of that test? Cast into prison. Being forgotten. What was part of that test? Falsely being accused of raping his master's wife. What was the blessing in that? He learned an appreciation for his freedom. What was the blessing in that? When he worked for him, for Potiphar, when he worked for him, everything he put his hands to increased. What was the blessing while he was in jail? He became a trustee and had rule over the whole thing. Are you getting this? He was able to interpret dreams and using that gift to Pharaoh, put him second in command of all of Egypt. Now, to the Egyptian mind, this is what I'm not saying, this is going to mess with you, God. The Egyptians considered Pharaoh 